Hey guys, hello and welcome to another episode of Visiting Professionals. I'm your host, Austin Slaybaugh, and today I'm visiting with production sound mixer, Mark Hagen. Hey Austin, how's it going? Not too bad, man. Stay tuned, guys. We've got a lot of great stuff coming up. Hi, my name is Austin Slaybaugh. I'm a student at Oakland University. Most of my time is spent on campus in class. But when I'm not hitting the books, I'm visiting professionals. Today on Visiting Professionals, I'm visiting with production sound mixer, Mark Hagen. Mark has worked on various local, national, and international film productions. I met with Mark on set near downtown Detroit to see what he does as a career. Hey, how's it going, Mark? Hey, Austin, nice to see you. So uh, what do we got going on today, man? Uh, we're working on a uh, Fortnite challenge film uh, with some friends of mine. Awesome, care for check it out? Come check out the set, yeah. Mark took me into the set where he was teaming up with a group of local filmmakers to participate in the Capital City Film Festival Fortnite Film Contest. Back up. In between takes, Mark was able to show me his bag of tricks when it comes to audio production. So Mark, you're always running around with this big bag strapped on your chest. What exactly do you got in here? Everything I need to record today. Let's start off with a mixer recorder. This is the recorder part here. It'll do up to eight isolated tracks and then two sets of stereo pairs for mix. This is a CL8, which is an add-on piece to this, which allows me to take the inputs and mix them to camera or to anywhere else, another recorder, just have a stereo mix when you're mixing them down. That's why they call it a mixer, because you're taking the multiple tracks and mixing them down to a single or a stereo track. Um, and it makes it for people to handle easier. Matter of fact, when um, people start editing the video, usually they're just listening to the mix track, and then after it's all cut and locked, then they go back to get the ISO tracks, which are isolated on each microphone, so they tend to have less background noise, they tend to have a little more presence and uh, be a little fuller um, sounding. So these are my Electrosonic uh, UCR411, wireless receivers. Okay. Um, probably the best on the market. I could say all sorts of tech stuff about it, but nobody would understand. Um, but they're really great. They have wonderful range and they sound as good as a wired microphone. Just, just fantastic. Mark, so I know we have Zach here, uh, one of the actors from the film that you were just shooting on. Uh, what did you do to mic him up properly for the set? Well, when Miking an actor for a narrative, you try to hide the mic the best you can. So the sternum right here is a little indent, so we call that the gap on a woman and just a, like it's a little cereal bowl. So I made a little moleskin sandwich here, taped it to him, brought the wire around because if you come this way, you can usually see it through the shirt, off to his side, down his leg, you can lower this if you'd like, all the way down here, he unzips it. We have it in an ankle pack and it just hides away. This way he can be totally mobile as he's running around the set, and we don't have to worry about seeing it here, having to fall back his pants or anything like that. Yeah, wow, that's insane. I never would have even thought they had all that on you. Now, Mark, we have another one of the actors with us, Aaron, and uh, you said that you mic'd Aaron up just a little bit different than we did uh, the other actor before. You care showing me what we got going on today? I did. Fortunate today, everyone's wearing like soft t-shirt and, and clothes, so they're, not no no so they're not noisy. This is the sweet spot for a microphone. It's about six to eight inches from the chin. Um, if I wasn't able to do this, I would have gone around the collar, around the back, and then put it in here. Now the thing is, he's wearing shorts, so I really couldn't put an ankle bracelet on him because that would uh, be seen. So what I did instead, if he doesn't mind. No, go for it. It's like we've got... Oh wow, I do have a little contraption here. So we've got the tape with a moleskin sandwich covering it up right on his chest, coming around here to keep the wire in. You just rotate around here for me. The wire is just tucked in back here. Well, they got a little sloppy during the acting, um, but the transmitter is packed right in here in this little pocket. And so he's sitting most of the day. So this looks like it's a little loose. Is this how it should? No, let's redo this too a little bit. All right, suck it in, Aaron. You're on TV. Yeah, suck it in. <laughs> All right, 
so he's got that. Now, if he gets up later, I might ask him to pull this down where it's tucked in here a tad bit. You get personal with these guys. <laughs> um, but anyhow, it's like, this is the only thing that scares me. Sometimes it gets loose and it'll pop out there. This one's getting a little old, but because he's sitting, I'm really not too afraid of it. Plus, he has a blanket as part of his, uh, um, I guess, environment where he's sitting, yeah which is covering him a little bit too. So it's like you're not really seeing it, but I may lower that to below the shorts um, if he gets some more action. So Mark, in between takes, I, I see we're not using a Slater clapboard. So why is that? Well, on shoots like today, when you're trying to be fast, it's like that can slow you down quite a bit. So we have time code to camera, and we also have audio to camera and that should uh, work out fine in the slate. It would just be another redundancy. Mark, what is time code? Uh, time code is a clock and syncing of the clock for the camera and for the audio files. So when you put them into the computer in post, you can match up the actual hour, minute, seconds, and frames. So it's exactly on when you go to sync the sound with the video. Contestants only have a week to produce their short film entries, so the production went on through the night and into the early hours of the morning. Mark, being the professional he is, stayed locked in and did a great job recording audio for the film. Coming up after the break, my visit continues with Mark Hagen as I sit down to ask him some more important questions about his career. When Visiting Professionals continues. Welcome back to Visiting Professionals. Today, I'm visiting with production sound mixer, Mark Hagen. Mark kindly agreed to sit down for an interview, and I had some more questions to ask him about his career. Mark, thanks for sitting down with me. How are you doing today? Doing great. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome, man. Well, I just want to get to a little, uh, know just a little bit about yourself. You grew up around Michigan? Born and raised in Warren, Michigan. Moved down river for a little bit, and then... Uh, Moved back to the uh, east side about 10 years ago. Awesome, awesome. Now, uh, going into this career path, did you have uh, any prior schooling that led you into maybe thinking that this was what you wanted to do? Well, I started in sound back in high school, played in bands, owned a PA system, and just fell in love with it. So right out of high school, I went to a place called the Recording Workshop in Chillicothe, Ohio, to learn studio um, recording and, and music production. And uh, the band was playing the college circuit at that time. So next thing I know, when the band eventually broke up, it was eight years out of school with no experience. So I uh, started installing sound systems and just going that route, which eventually turned into like home theater, which was kind of a drag. And so around 2002, 2003, I said, you know what, I wanted to get into recording. I lost my passion for music, and I said, let's see what film is like. Mm -hmm. So I went to a local film school and uh, fell in love. It was, this job is just so perfect for me. You do something different every day. You see different people every day. It's not like going to the office, which you know some people love. I did not, so there could not be a better job for me. Mark, would you say that being in a band kind of sparked your interest into being a production sound mixer? I would absolutely say that it sparked my interest in recording. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I knew I wanted to do recording of some type, you know, back in high school when the band was brand new. Uh, most production sound mixers that I know come from a music background, either musicians or an engineer um, in, in studios or, or live mixing. It's very rare that you find somebody who doesn't have a music background that gets into production sound mixing. Okay. Now, what's something about production sound mixing that the average person wouldn't necessarily know? What we focus on is not necessarily the dialogue that the actors are giving, but it's reducing all the noises and interruptions and disruptions around set, whether it's dogs barking, planes flying overhead, trains coming by, 
cars honking, road noise, people walking on hardwood floors, talking on their cell phone, creaks in chairs. That's the stuff that we're there to eliminate. We're more of a problem solver. The, the recording part of it is not difficult if you're competent with your equipment, mm -hmm. but it's the, uh, the, the largest part of the job is eliminating as much noise as you could. At least that's in the narrative. Mm -hmm. If you're doing documentary work, a lot of that stuff stays in just because it gives it a sense of realism. Gotcha. Now, would you say that that's the hardest part of the job is trying to eliminate all those other sounds and make the sound that you want crisp and clear? That depends on how well the production is planned. Uh, a lot of times when you're on a location, it's chosen primarily for the look of it. And they might go there on a Tuesday afternoon and say, oh, this is great. But when you're shooting on a Thursday evening and there's noise going on everywhere, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a whole different story. Then sometimes you can fix it, sometimes you can't. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a production that was like put on hold because you had too much other noise that was you know, interfering with what you were trying to do? Uh, no. The, the jobs I typically work on have limited budgets. Um, I think the largest one I was on, which sounds like a lot of money, is about a million and a half dollars. But um, the production uh, part of that money goes maybe like three or four hundred thousand dollars. And so you don't have spare days to reshoot those kind of things. Um, there was a movie I did back in 2011 where we shot in an apartment downtown. We shot at night because we were right off a, a major road, which was noisy during the day. But what they didn't know was that a choir practice next door oh, no. on, <laughs> yeah, on, on, on Tuesday evenings. And so you could hear the choir singing their gospel music all the way through it. Mm. So all you can do is set your gains properly or the best you can, adjust your mics and, and, and face them to kind of minimize that kind of stuff. I know they didn't recording it was there, but thank goodness that technology for post-production has gotten better where you can... If you can't eliminate it, you can minimize it and mask it a little bit. Mm -hmm. How important would you say sound is to whatever it is that you're trying to film? Oh, well, for a, whether it's a documentary or TV show or narrative commercial, um, like I said, the sound is half the experience. Uh, it's really important. If you, Your job is to capture the actor's performance on set. When actors get into their zone, they give it all. And if you don't capture it right the first time, then they have to go into a studio afterwards and try to recreate it. Recreating it hardly ever gives you the same feeling that they, that they gave on set. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's critical. And the better crew you work with, the easier it is to, to get that. If, you're, if your gaffer lights properly, so when you put your boom over the actor's head, you don't get shadows, uh, you can get it nice and tight and you can grab the whole performance. If not, we use the wireless but wireless have their limitations too. Would you say that a lot of the work that you do is mainly for uh, clients that are working on big projects or more personal? The, the work that I do would be considered more corporate or industrial, and that's by choice. I always felt that once I'm on a job for more than three or four days, it feels like a job to me, and I just want to run. Um, so I've been what I call the, the king of day play since I started. I don't mind taking the one day job, the two day job, the three day jobs. Sometimes a week long is, is fine, but I don't want to be on a reality show where I'm working on the same job for 30 to 60 days. I really don't enjoy features. Um, they last 20 to 30 days for the low budget ones, but they take me away from home too long. Mm -hmm. and hours are longer. I, I, I just enjoy the commercial and corporate type work more and so that's what I choose. Do you have any uh, favorite clients that you've worked with in the past? Well I'm, I'm fortunate enough to work with you know some of you know Detroit's bigger companies. Um, I thoroughly enjoy working with uh, the Quicken Loans and the Quicken Loans Media House team. I've done work for uh, DTE Energy if you've seen Ben Bailey with the Know Your Own Power um, commercials. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, many of the uh, uh, local charities, um, well, not necessarily charities, but uh, um, nonprofits like, like Haven. Uh, there's just so many, and a lot of them small. I'd have to say 80% of the work that I do come from production companies that come from out of state. 
Um, and then we end up working either a show or for a company that, you know, it's a small company that I've never heard of, and you spend two days with them, and then, then they're gone. And over the last 13, 14 years, there's just been so many, it's really hard to keep them straight. When you, you started doing all these things, was there ever a production that you worked on where you just really thought, wow, like, this is awesome, like, I'm glad to do this, I'm happy to do this, and I, I, I want to keep doing it? I mean, I've enjoyed so many. Uh, I did work on a documentary for about a year and a half called Generation Startup, and that had an Academy Award winning director, Cynthia Wade, and I was fortunate enough that she liked my work well enough that she flew me off to Indonesia about a year and a half ago, wow. and we spent 14 days there working on another documentary. Um, so that benefit really made work on a Generation Startup worth it. So Mark, what advice would you give to a student that's looking to go down this same career path? Say, this is such a great job. Uh, you'd want to study sound. Uh, there are, know your microphones, know your patterns, know your equipment extremely well. If you're competent uh, with your equipment and, and you know it inside and out, the job is fairly simple. Uh, but the major part of working in this field is being friendly, being likable, and being able to make those connections on set because you're going to live off of referrals and you're going to live off of referrals by people who like you. Mm -hmm. And people who don't like you are not going to refer you for jobs. And that's, that's how you find work. How much would you say has been you yourself going out and trying to find work as opposed to being you know, referred by past customers to new clients? The first two years, it was, you know, you're starting out, you don't have a name. It's like you might not have all the equipment you need. Um, so you really have to search. Back then, this was about 2005, you're looking at, there are job sites online, Mandy, Media Match, Craigslist used to be a source for it. And a lot of these places have kind of failed. There's Production Hub. Um, but you also need to follow now on social media, Facebook and Instagram. And if you see DPs or producers, you, you need to be brave enough to reach out and make their acquaintance. Um, you, you have to be able to make connections. Uh, a lot of times when, when you're starting out, you may not be able to get a full day rate, so you'll be working for less money, but the job is much smaller too, and you may have the equipment to do that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the job is just a three-hour sit-down interview, much like this. And if you own a recorder and a boom, you could do this job today. Um, but you have to also make sure that, that you can do it well. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you won't be hired again. Because right. I guess that's another sad point, is once you mess up and, and trash your reputation by that, that gets around pretty fast. So you really need to do it. You, a, lot, most, a lot of times you have just one shot to get what you need. Coming up after the break, my interview with Mark Hagen concludes as I sit down to ask him some more questions. When Visiting Professionals continues. University Television is here to provide you educational, engaging, and entertaining content. Catch OUTV live on Comcast Channel 41 or on the internet at oakland.edu forward slash OUTV. OUTV, it's on and popping. Welcome back to Visiting Professionals. Today, I'm visiting with production sound mixer, Mark Hagen. I had some final questions for Mark, and he was happy to answer. Now, how would a student who, you know, might not necessarily have all the money in the world go about getting all this equipment that a sound mixer needs? Well, sadly, things have changed. Back when I started, it was right on the verge of that change where digital equipment came out and it became more affordable. Now, for me, I, I started out a little bit older. I was in my late 30s and I had money, I already had business, I was able to purchase a few things that I needed. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time you can rent the equipment from a, you know, a local rental place or even a national rental place, but uh, if, if you're not booked far enough in advance, you don't have enough time to do it. So nowadays, most mixers own their own equipment because you might get a call today 
for a job tomorrow morning and you don't have time to go pick up the gear. Uh, it's worth, if you have credit or parents that you can borrow the money or use it, it's, it's worth spending the four or $5,000 you would need to get started because you can make that back in your first 10 to 20 gigs. And then it's paid for and then you move on and then you keep on buying more gear with the more you work. Um, I've helped a couple other local sound mixers, given them that advice, they, they bought it. And then knowing other sound mixers or getting to know them, sometimes, you know, guys that I know, including me, we might get a call, two or three calls for the same date. And then you, we, in our community, we share the gigs and we try to help other people out and get those gigs. With this job, would you say that you work mostly uh, by yourself trying to do a lot of these productions or do you have a, a whole team that kind of helps you out in everything that you do? When working on a film, it should be at least a three-man crew. There's a production sound mixer and then there's the, the boom op and then typically a utility. The mixer is the guy that stands behind the, uh, the actual mixer, sets levels and records and listens for all the problems. The boom op job, um, is sometimes overlooked, but it's probably the most important job in the sound department because you're avoiding lights and shadows, you're staying out of the camera frame, you're dancing around the set as the actors move. It is not an easy job. Um, there's many productions I've been on where the producer or director says, oh, just hand it to a, a, a PA with no experience. I'd rather have a PA hit the record button on the mixer than I would boom. Um, then the utility is on larger sets where you might have 10, 15 people with lavalier microphones. Uh, they're there to wrap cables, put microphones on people, collect the microphones um, after they're done or, you know, leaving sets and making sure that everything stays together because both mixing and booming is full time on set and you really, really can't be it, it gets a little busy when you're trying to do all those jobs at once. Mark, what would you say has been uh, some of the biggest difficulties that you've ever had working on a set? Most of the time, the, uh, the difficulties are just the environments we're in. Whether they're noisy and close to noise, construction and road, or whether or not it's like they're just not really great for working on a narrative. Um, and, and environments like that would be highly reflective that have reverb, um, where the sound is uh, bouncing all over the place. Because when you're trying to capture dialogue, most of the time you want it to sound like it's in, a, like in, in the room that you're really in. If you're in a museum, you really know that it's made out of marble and that sound's going to reflect and you're going to hear that in the microphone. If you're in a living room, you're not going to hear those reflections. Um, I was doing some promo work for the movie Detroiters, uh, where one of the actors, uh, LG Smith, was doing an interview. It actually had real reverb, and to explain that is most small rooms and small room acoustics have uh, what they call early reflections. So if you clap your hand, you can hear that come back and die. Actual reverb is where you can excite the room, let's say if you were clapping your hands, and when you stop clapping your hands, that sound is still there, and then it slowly subsides. It might take a second, second and a half, and, it get, and that's how this room was. So even being like eight to 10 feet away, you really couldn't understand what the person was saying through the room. So, as I said earlier, that if you really know your equipment, you, you know how to handle something like that. Mm -hmm. So I was fortunate enough that I had uh, sound blankets that I put on the floor, we hung up on the sides, and I used a, uh, a hypercardioid microphone for, for the boom. Now that reduces the amount of pickup that it has and it picks up uh, just around uh, the, the person you're interviewing. I also had a lavalier microphone on them that was picking up the reverb also, so I lowered the sensitivity on that. So instead of the microphone picking up like a wide space, it was just picking up a small space, the six inches. So it ends up sounding much more direct and with much more presence. Now, flipping the world just a little bit, going from uh, some of the low lights, what's the highlight of your career? The highlight was definitely going to Indonesia with Cynthia Wade. Um, I had wanted to travel ever since I was young, so when she offered me the trip, I absolutely took it. Um, and the older I get, it's like I plan on doing more traveling. Now, what would you say are some of the staples of equipment that you personally love to use? That I'd love to use or that you need to use to do this job? Well, we'll do a little bit of both. Okay, well, to do this job, 
Uh, there's, you could get away with just a recorder and a uh, boom pole and a shotgun microphone. You could do a movie all by itself on that. Uh, but to do a multitude of work, you also need wires or, or wireless systems and lavalier microphones. Um, and that's where things get a little tough. Uh, there are less expensive ones, but they lack in range and sound quality. Professional ones are quite expensive. Uh, there are certain brands that I enjoy, but it's like there's a few professional brands that you'll see everywhere. Uh, what I enjoy is sound devices, mixers. I like them because they're built like tanks and they're American made. I enjoy electrosonic um, wireless systems, same thing, American made. But um, if you have to start off and use something less expensive, like I started off with uh, more of a prosumer uh, Sennheiser um, wireless, and I worked those things until they bought me my electrosonics. And now I use those as what they call camera links, so I can send uh, the signal to the cameras, so when they watch the dailies or they watch mm. the clips, the sound quality on camera is good. And when they sync it up, they have options. They can typically do it with time code, they can do it with the sound quality, or if somebody slates ahead. Most of the TV stuff that I do, there is no slate. Slates are reserved for um, narratives, and um, I, don't, I don't use a slate very often on, mm. on most of it. So time code and uh, having that scratch track on the uh, camera is really important. So you, you could own a Zoom and a, and a Boom, and you could do a low-budget or a student film, but you could not do a professional commercial. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do the professional commercial, you can't make the professional rate. And so if you want to have this career, you need to start off with s at least a professional recorder. Mm -hmm. At least I, I would suggest Gotta that. Gotta work your way up. Yeah. Uh, how important would you say it is to know the ins and out of the equipment that you're using? Oh, it's vital. Um, if something goes wrong or something's not acting right, or you have to do a different workflow that you're not used to, um, you need to know how to, how to patch the equipment and how to, through the uh, internal menus, how to route things properly to get the sound where it needs to go. Now, Mark, one last question before we wrap everything up here. Is this the best job in the world? Yes. It's absolutely the best job in the world. Maybe not for everybody, but it's good money. Um, I work uh, not a full year, and I'm still happy with what I make. Uh, I get to meet new and interesting people on a weekly basis. I get to see a lot of the same crew members over and over and over throughout the year. Um, I love recording. I love the challenges of being in a space and making it sound right. You look like a hero. Um, it's, it's just the best thing that I could have found, and I'm glad I found it. It's, I started off thinking I wanted to be in a studio doing music. I am so happy that didn't happen, and I ended up on set doing production sound. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Visiting Professionals. I'd like to give a special thanks to Mark Hagen, and until next time, guys, I'm your host, Austin Slaybaugh, signing off.